Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. We're doing a little mini-series called The Last Days According to the King. If you've missed the first part of Matthew chapter 24, again, I would encourage you either to get the information or the the CD from the from the uh, media center or go online and, and download it and, and watch it uh, when it's convenient. Matthew chapter 24. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 4 through 8 in Matthew chapter 24. As we continue our look at the last days according to the king. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are convinced that Jesus is coming back. Lord, you've given us permission to have this hope in our heart. Lord, we remember that the New Testament calls this the blessed hope, that we can, with all of our affection and all of our might, long for that moment. And Heavenly Father, if for whatever reason that today is not the day that Jesus returns, Lord, we pray that you would inflame our heart as we continue to watch, as we continue to pray. Lord, we we pray with the generations that went before us that perhaps today, maybe this day, our beloved will come. And as the early church said to one another, Maranatha, the Lord cometh. And so again, Lord, prepare our hearts, prepare our minds, give us wisdom as we look into these important things. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 4, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I'm the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of rumor of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. What is meant by the last days? In broad terms, it means the days that lead up to the glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The chapter began with observations and discussions about the second temple in Jerusalem in verse 1. Jesus predicts the temple's total destruction in verse 2. And the disciples ask Jesus, when is all this going to happen? When is the return going to take place? When is the end of the age going to come? This doesn't mean Christ's return for the church or the end of the church age since those truths are going to remain hidden at least for a moment and Paul is going to receive a revelation concerning the reality of the church and the meaning of the church and the purpose of the church and the church being the uniting of Jew and Gentile Remember, that's part of the mystery that Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians, which we're studying on Wednesdays. And so the statements Jesus gives at the beginning of chapter 24 seem very Jewish in their orientation. The statements given include a reference to the Sabbath in verse 20. Jesus makes reference to the Daniel the prophet in verse 15 which of course talks about God's dealing with both Jew and Gentile. 
And then he talks about the holy city of Jerusalem. And a reference is made to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. The warnings about deception and false messianic pretenders seem directed at the Jews since true believers acknowledge that Jesus is God's Messiah in verses 4 and 5. Believers are warned to watch out, not necessarily for, for false Christ, but rather... For false teachers and false spirits, John, in writing in, in, in 1 John largely to an encyclical that's taking place in Anatolia or ancient Turkey, he says, test the spirits to see whether or not they're of, of God. In 2 Peter chapter 2, um, verse 1, it's repeated. Jesus is also speaking from the Mount of Olives which is reminiscent of Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4, and is associated with the Messiah's return to establish a kingdom and for the Messiah to sit on the throne of David. The writer of Hebrews declares, with the appearing of Jesus, we could begin to speak about the last days. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, it says, hath He hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he is appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So the last days begin with the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus and the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. There's lots of good reasons to study end-time prophecy. Paul and Peter would later command God's people to search the scriptures. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 through 20. Because it's the scriptures that testify about God's dealing with the world and the end of the world, Isaiah 65, verses 17 through 25, Jesus repeatedly reminds his disciples to watch for his future coming. We're going to see that in chapter 24, verse 42. Watch, if you look at the end of the chapter, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Matthew 25, 13, just turn the page. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Mark 13, 35 repeats the warning. Luke 12, 37 repeats the warning. Paul writes to the believers at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5, 4. He says, but you brothers and sisters are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. Let us be awake and sober in the book of Revelation from the lips of Jesus to our ears in Revelation chapter 16 verse 15 it says look I come like a thief blessed is the one who stays awake aren't you glad Jesus didn't say blessed is everyone who stays awake for Jesus for Gino's sermon I know I see you nodding off over there yeah, it's not a biblical principle. You, there's nothing in the Bible that says I have to stay awake for Gino's sermon. You're exactly right. But we are given permission to be sober, to stay awake, to look for Jesus' coming. We're given permission to consider the last days. But how do we steer clear of fanciful speculations. How do we avoid stupidity? We obey Paul and Peter's command. We search the scriptures. We exercise discernment. We embrace the task of a Berean. We search the scriptures to see whether or not these things are so. And so I'm going to invite you to search the scriptures, to evaluate what is being said, and to 
make comparison and then draw conclusions. But look what it says at the very beginning of Jesus' talk about these important issues. He talks about deception by false teachers, false Christ, false messiahs. In verse 4, it says, and Jesus answered and said to them. Remember, the answer is, when is the destruction going to take place? When is all of this stuff going to unfold? He says, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I'm the Christ, and deceive many. The expression translated, take heed, or be warned, or see, is the Greek word blepo. Blepo sounds like bleepo, like when something's bleeped out, but it's not a cuss word. In the Greek language, it means literally, open your eyes. It's a command. Literally, it it says, open your eyes. The emphasis on this translated take heed, open your eyes, includes the sentiment, be watchful, be vigilant, open your eyes. We're on a road marked last days or in times, on this highway, there's going to be signs of nature and signs in society. There's going to be spiritual signs. There's going to be political signs. There's going to be technological signs. But also, there's going to be signs that are unique and specific to Israel. It shouldn't come as a surprise that the first sign we see, oddly enough, is a warning about people who look at signs. Have you ever been driving and you looked so hard at the sign you actually went off the road? Or, or This is part of the point. That in this discussion, Jesus says, you need to beware of deception. Slow down. Pretend messiahs are up ahead. There's an inherent problem with people who look for signs and sign watchers because they're subject to deception. Almost in every single generation, there's been some crackpot who has said, oh, by the way, Jesus is going to come back in 1967, in 1973, in 1983, in 1976. The list goes on and on. 88 reasons why he's coming in 88. In 2000, there was a conference that was held from some of my friends who I think inappropriately got people in some sort of crazy stir stir about Y2K. Some of you remember in the year 2000, think about it, 17 years ago, that when the computers switch over, there's going to be a catastrophic event. And I said, you know what? I watched the bombing in the Middle East. They bombed Baghdad, and the next day there were lights on. Are you going to tell me that a computer glitch is going to shut down everything? Oh, yes. I go, I think that you're misunderstanding what's happening. A person said to me, their blood is going to be on your head. So does anyone remember, those of you old enough to remember, What happened January 2nd in the year 2000? A big, fat, stinking nothing. Recently, there have been people who have seen signs of blood moons. And they said, something amazing is about to happen. Do you know what happened? Nothing. There's an inherent problem with people who watch for signs and who are sign watchers. False prophets can produce false signs. One of the things that we have to learn is that there is such a thing as counterfeit signs. The very fact that Jesus issues this warning is a testimony to just how gullible people are. Jesus says, many will come in my name. In that sense, it means come under the authority or the auspices of Jesus, saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. 
I don't have time to go over the laundry list, but a simple search at Wikipedia, just type in people who have claimed to be Christ, and you're going to see a list at Wikipedia of about 150 different people almost in every single generation. Note what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say, you guys are way too smart to fall for something so patently absurd and so obviously foolish. You're smart, you're intuitive, you're sensitive. Why, you can spot a counterfeit a mile away. He doesn't say that. He basically says people are going to come in my name and they're going to be deceived. Jesus will repeat this warning in verses 23 and 24. <laughs> it says in verse 23, Then, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, don't believe it. Verse 24, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive. You know what that word means. Deceive means to cause someone to believe something that's simply not true. And lots of people traffic in deception. Some jobs actually require deception, like magicians and illusionists. But if you're watching a magician or an illusionist, you're sitting there trying to figure out how they're tricking you. And it's supposed to be all fun and games. Other jobs, while not requiring deception, seem to attract the fair share of deceivers. It's almost like politicians, certain salesmen. I was looking for a car, and a person came up to me and he said, what is it going to take for you to buy this car for me today? And I said, if you can solve world hunger and completely eliminate the threat of nuclear disaster, I will buy this car from you today. And the guy goes, no, no, really. And I said, really? I'm hoping you're getting the impression I'm not going to buy a car from you today. So there are deceivers, politicians, salesmen, and worst of all, people in ministry. And sometimes people in science. There was a group of students at Harvard who tried to fool their very famous professor of zoology, Louis Agassiz. They took parts from a number of different insects, and with great skill, they got cobbled together, together to, to make a creation that they were, sh were sure would baffle their teacher. And on the chosen day, they brought their project to the teacher for his inspection. And Professor Agassiz looked at the fabrication with great scrutiny, and he said, I've identified it. Scarcely able to control their amusement, the students said, What's its name? And Agassi said, This bug? It's a humbug. <laughs> the greatest weapon in our fight against deception has to be a thorough knowledge of the truth. And so when people come up to you and they say, I'm Christ, you need to be able to say, Show me your scars. Show them to me. And then take them to the nearest body of water and say, walk on this water. Show me the nail imprints. Show me the scars. Prove to me that you're Jesus. Say the things that Jesus would say. Do the things that Jesus would do. And pretty soon you're going to say, I thought so. You're a fraud. In order to avoid being deceived, even in our day, we have to focus on Jesus. We have to focus on God's word. We have to be careful how we evaluate signs. We have to be very careful how we look at people. And for the most part, we need to not so much look at people, but look at the Lord Jesus Christ. We need, we need to be very, very careful when we take our eyes off the revelation that's given in the Bible 
Jesus promises a plethora of false Christs and false prophets. And remember, typically, a false prophet will have a false message. The false prophet will tell you something other than what Jesus told you. Some Bible scholars argue that <clears throat> there were people who claimed to be the Christ right between the period of the ascension of Jesus into heaven and the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD. And I would agree with that. R.C. Sproul quotes Russell, quote, false Christs and false prophets began to make their appearance at a very early period in the Christian era. And then he lists one man who appeared during the procuratorship of Pontius Pilate in 36 AD, who appeared in Samaria and deluded great multitudes. During the administration of Felix, who was a procurator between 53 and 60 AD, typically during the time of Paul, Josephus recounts, quote, the country was full of robbers, magicians, false prophets, false messiahs, imposters who deluded the people with promises of great events, unquote. In the New Testament, in Acts chapter 5, verse 36 and 37, we read about a guy named Thutis and Judas of Galilee. Later, about Simon Magus, who claimed to be this great power of God in Acts chapter 8, verse 9. In 132 AD, there was a man named Simon Bar Kochba, or Kosaba, who claimed to be a messianic deliverer. He was even affirmed by many of the, of the rabbinic people, one in particular named Akiba. He called on the people to follow him in another failed attempt at reclamation of the land of Judea. He claimed, quote, God showed him that if they confronted the Roman armies, none of the Jews would be killed. When the battle was over and the dust cleared, 580,000 more Jews lost their lives. If we were to compile a list of everyone who claims to be the Messiah, I wouldn't be able to read the list to you before my time would literally be up. False messiahs have been with us in the past. False messiahs continue with us in the present. And should Jesus delay his coming... I'm absolutely certain that they're going to continue to come. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 3, it says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false prophets among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Whoever these people are and whatever they do, here's what they wind up doing. Number one, they misrepresent Jesus. Number two, they'll come with a false gospel. And the false gospel will almost certainly include something other than what's been revealed in the New Testament. The word translated destructive ways is literally licentiousness, a word that describes self-indulgent behavior. The false prophets, the false Christ, the false messiahs invite you to satisfy yourself. Peter goes on and says in, in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3, by covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. Covetous means wanting more and more of what you already have enough of. In other words, they don't see you as human beings. They see you as product. They'll take advantage of you. They want to use you. By covetousness, they'll exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. It's Peter's way of saying... These people who take advantage of other people in order to satisfy themselves, they're going to have to face the real Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, unquote. 
Not only will they engage in the deception, but apparently many of them will begin to believe their own deceptions. According to the Bible, these imposters will increase until one final imposter makes his way onto the scene. He's called the Antichrist. This person is also called the little horn in Daniel chapter 7 verse 8. The willful king in Daniel chapter 11 verse 36. The man of sin and the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3. The wicked one, 2 Thessalonians 2 8. The beast, Revelation chapter 11 verse 7. And we're going to have a lot more to say about him in the weeks ahead. Human beings crave safety, security, so what's the first sign? Counterfeit Christ, false messiahs. What's the second sign? Look what it says. Global violence, destruction by wars. Look what Jesus says. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The next sign that we see on the last day's highways is reading conflict up ahead, wars, rumors of wars. Before the end comes, expect increasing conflict. I want you to think about this for just a moment. The presence of war confirms what James wrote long ago in James chapter 4, verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members, unquote? Jesus says, don't be frightened. Expect wars. But it's hard not to be frightened. It's difficult. It's difficult when you think about North Korea having nuclear capability. It's absolutely difficult when you think of Iran having nuclear capability with all of the talk of a desire to literally eliminate the nation of Israel. The presence of war indicates that the hearts of men think carefully about what Jesus is saying. They will not grow towards global peace but global conflict. Jesus also makes it clear that as horrible as war is, that the presence of war indicates his return still remains in the future. When Jesus returns literally and physically and bodily to the planet Earth, the nations of the Earth will unite together in one last ditch effort to resist his rule. The nations of the earth won't come together to accept him. They'll come together one last time to reject him. In over 3,100 years of recorded world history, the world has experienced peace only 8% of that time, or a total of 286 years out of the over 3,100 years. 8,000 treaties have been made and broken. During the Cold War, people were terrified over the prospects of nuclear exchange. When I was a little boy growing up in the early, early 60s, in first grade, second grade, and third grade, sirens would go off and we would have to hide under our desks. They would show us pictures of the ravages of, of a nuclear holocaust. And I always thought, how is holding my head down underneath the desk going to save me from nuclear annihilation. Some analysts say that there's going to be a problem, that humanity could literally be destroyed by a nuclear holocaust, but the Bible is clear. Human beings will persist on the planet until the return of Christ. John Corson cites the Bible 
the Club of Rome, part of the European Economic Community. He cites the War Atlas. In that book, it claims that there hasn't even been a single day of peace. According to the War Atlas, there are 32 million soldiers on active duty with 570 in reserve. In addition, 50% of all scientists are engaged in weapons research. 40% of all of the money spent on scientific endeavors broadly goes to weapons research and development. The Center for Defense Information estimates that one in every three people who live on the planet Earth live in an area that is subject to armed conflict. Blaise Pascal, the French philosopher who literally and modern inventor of, of computing, wrote, Can anything be more ridiculous than that a man should have the right to kill me because he lives on the other side of the water, and because his ruler has a quarrel with mine, though I have none with him, unquote. He understood the absurdity. Why is it that there's a guy in North Korea who wants to kill us? Why, why do the people in Iran see us as the great Satan and want us dead? But yet, this is the world in which we live. It is a deeply divided world. There are people... Given the opportunity, they would love to kill you. If they could smuggle a bomb into our church and blow it up, they would be happy. There are people in the world who are making it a conscientious effort to create a mechanism for global war. I'm going to read a quote to you. You tell me who said it. Quote, every gun that is made Every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. The world in arms is not spending money alone. It's spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the houses of its children. This is not a way of life under the cloud of war. It is humanity hanging himself on a cross of iron, unquote. Do you know who said that? It wasn't some peace-loving, tree-hugging, communist, bleeding-heart liberal. It was Dwight David Eisenhower who led the combined forces in World War II. It was a general who understood just how horrible war really is. I want to tell you something. If you gave me the money... Not that was spent all over the world, but just here. If you gave me every dime of the defense budget, you know what I could do? I could make sure that there's clean water for every human being on the planet Earth. You know what else I could do? I could build a schoolhouse in every single community on the planet. I could build a church in every single village and give them the gospel. Hot wars cold wars, political posturing. Jesus said it's going to continue in frequency, intensity. Albert Einstein was once asked what weapons would be used in World War III. He said, I don't know. But I can tell you the weapons that will be used in World War IV, sticks and stones. If there is a World War III, and if there is a World War IV, he's got it exactly right. Note what Jesus says. See that you're not troubled. But we are troubled when social and political and global circumstances change rapidly, when regions destabilize, when you're under the constant threat we're sometimes tempted to think God's not really in control. We might also be tempted to think that God's lost control of the situation and that the promises in the Bible can't possibly be trusted and they can't possibly come true. Jesus says, what you're seeing is a part of God's unfolding plan for the future. What? Why would Jesus allow religious frauds and global crisis 
the presence of false teachers? And the answer is not so much that he allows it, but rather wickedness lies in the heart of men and God is going to allow wicked people to do wicked things for a while, for a moment. But one day it's going to come to a crashing halt. And we have to remember that our hope isn't in this world. We have duties as citizens on this planet called earth. But if you're a Christian, if you know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, your citizenship is in heaven, it says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, and again in Ephesians chapter 1. We don't fear men or world events. We understand that they can take our lives, but they can't take our souls. Our lives are in God's hand. And this includes the events that are going to unfold in your lifetime. And then as he says, destruction by disasters. Look what it says in verses 7 and 8. In verse 7 it says, For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in various places. What's the first sign? Pretenders. False Christ. What's the second sign? World violence. Jesus says nation will rise against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. The implication is that no nation, think about this. What Jesus, when he says nation will rise against nation and kingdom will, against kingdom, that no nation is entirely exempt from the threat of war. Well, what if you're Switzerland and you want to remain neutral all the time in each and every conflict? Well, the truth is, you can make a conscientious effort to be as neutral as you want, but in the midst of challenging times, wars are going to continue along geographical lines, along ethnic lines, along language lines, along cultural lines. So what can we expect? The book of Daniel and the book of Revelation paints a bleak picture of coming conflicts Deception by false Christ, destruction by repeated global conflict, devastation by disasters, because with war comes famine. With war comes famine and pestilence, followed by earthquakes. Another sign, a third sign, natural disasters in the form of famines, pestilence, and earthquakes. The New Testament, by the way, will mention a famine in the time of Claudius that affected the whole Roman Empire in Acts 11, 28 through 30. Josephus describes the famine as so severe that when flour was brought into the temple, not one of the priests was so hardy that, as to eat the crumbs. In my reading of Josephus, I discovered that 100,000 people fled into the temple right prior to the destruction. There were about six different factions inside of the temple, three major factions. But do you know what the Jews did in their own temple? One faction burned the grain of another faction, which burned the grain of that faction. And they could have held out against the Romans for years on end. But division and faction and complication caused them to destroy their own resources. Josephus said in another place, a famine did oppress them and many people died for want of what was necessary to procure food. The people on the inside were faced with two choices, either to die on the inside of Jerusalem or go out and be killed by the Romans. The ones who escaped would often have their entrails eviscerated. They would cut open their intestines and their stomach. Do you want to know why? Because people would swallow gold and they would swallow jewels. And so the Roman soldiers looking for wealth as people tried to escape would literally cut them open while they were still alive. 
In the last days before the fall of Jerusalem, Josephus mentions another famine, quote, it was now a miserable case and a sight that would justly bring tears into our eyes, how men stood to their food while more powerful had more than enough and the weaker were lamenting for want of it. This is Josephus, quote, then did the famine widen its progress, devoured the people by whole houses and families. The upper rooms were full of women and children that were dying by famine and the lanes of the city were full of the dead bodies of the aged. The children also and the young men wandered about the marketplaces like shadows swelled with famine. They fell fell down dead wheresoever their misery seized them. This is just a glimpse into one horror at this very moment. One out of every three children go to bed hungry. Famine exists right at this very moment. But in the last days, there's going to come a famine of horrific proportions. The book of Revelation, chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, lays it out. Another picture of famine is given by Jeremiah in the book of Lamentations, chapter 4, verse 9. This is after the destruction of the first temple. Quote, they that be slain with the sword are better than they which is slain for hunger. For these pine away, stricken though for want of the fruits of the field. The hands of the pitiful women have sodden, that means boiled, their own children. They were meat, that means food, in the destruction of my daughter and my people. It describes in both the first temple and later in the second temple, and I believe at a future time when war is going to bring about famine and people are going to literally, again, embrace cannibalism. The word for pestilence in the Greek language means a deadly malady or disease. These are the kinds of diseases following war and famine kill whole populations. In ancient times, like the bubonic plague decimated a whole population. But guess what? These plagues and pestilences have followed us into the not-so-remote past. At the turn of the 19th century, 30 million people died of of an influenza. There's Ebola. There's AIDS. In our own day, there are infectious diseases and biological agents that could cause massive population reductions. The rich can pay for food, but even the rich have no defense against pestilence. Josephus again writes that when Herod was in power, power, quote, there arose a pestilential disease and carried off the greatest part of the multitudes and of his best and most esteem. That means the wealthy. In other words, even their wealth did not protect them from the horror that came. Pestilence is going to be one of the terrible things that happen at the end of time. Part by the pale horse of the apocalypse that's written in the book of Revelation where it says power was given unto them, that's death and hell, over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, war, and with hunger, famine, and with death, pestilence resulting from the war and the famine. So the book of Revelation envisions a time when one out of every three people on the planet die. And then in human history, Cyprian in the third century predicted that the world would come to an end. Gregory in, in, the, in the sixth century, or actually it's the fourth century, repeated, excuse me, the sixth century, repeated the prediction. And then he talks about earthquakes. Are earthquakes more frequent and severe than ever before? I thought so until I did some research. According to Charles Richter, the inventor of the Richter scale, Prophecy pundits really have gotten it wrong. Richter argues that with modern technology, we've just simply been able to record and communicate earthquakes actively more quickly. We do have to come to grips with the fact that there was an earth movement in the ocean that caused in your, I'm thinking most of your lifetime, a tsunami of such major proportions that a quarter of a million people died in six minutes. But are earthquakes more frequent? Again, according to the World Data Center of Boulder, Colorado, it says, quote, 
There has been no significant increase in the numbers of earthquakes during this or any other century. Kitai Aki, Department of Geological Sciences at USC, quote, I feel very strongly that the seismicity has been stationary for thousands of years. Excellent geological evidence for the stationary status of our globe was obtained by Professor Kerry Sith of Caltech for the San Andreas Fault. Are there going to be earthquakes? Yes. If the big one comes to California and some of your relatives fall into the ocean, is it the end of the world? It's going to be the end of their world. What do all of these things have in common? Jesus says, can you expect more conflict? Yes. Can you expect frauds? Yes. Can you expect famines, plagues, and earth movements? Yes. At the last days, earthquakes are going to appear with surprising frequency and intensity according to Revelation chapter 6 verse 12, Revelation chapter 11 verse 12, chapter 16 verses 17 through 19. The Bible envisions an earthquake that literally changes the tectonics of our planet. What does this all mean? I'm going to suggest to you that before Jesus comes, the world itself is going to be in preparation for the end. And look what it says in verse 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows or trouble. The Greek word, odin, sorrow. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 it's translated a travail upon a woman with childbirth or, or labor pains. The verb form odino means birth pains. Some translate this birth pangs in the New American Standard. Birth pains. So when Jesus says these are the beginning of sorrows, he's basically using a metaphor of a woman who begins to enter into labor, but it's not a description as the labor is in the middle of the labor or at the end of the labor. It's just the beginning of the labor. The next verse in verse 9 says, they'll deliver you. Are they talking about the followers of Jesus? Are they talking about the Jewish people? Whatever this is and whenever it is, it's a special period marked out for intense persecution and tribulation. The Lord Jesus indicates that there's going to be a span of time that separates the beginning of the sorrows, the middle of the sorrows, and the end of the sorrows. Jesus indicates that there's a, going to be a time of suffering and destruction for the Jewish temple, that human history is going to march forward into God's planned goal. And what is that goal? It's Jesus coming back. It's a new heaven and a new earth. The Lord Jesus doesn't invite us to normalize or trivialize suffering. This doesn't mean that we just simply go, oh, people are hurt. Oh, people are killed. Oh, people are starving to death. That's not what this passage is inviting you to do. What the passage is inviting you to do is to remember that even in the midst of all of these painful circumstances, God remains in control. It really leaves us with one simple question that you should ask yourself. What does this mean to me? What should I do? Well, you should buy guns, gold, and groceries and, and find a farm in Montana and live it out. No, that's actually not what I'm going to invite you to do. Be aware. Be prepared. What else? Make every effort to endure. Make every effort to preach the gospel. Reach the lost. Worship God. Embrace personal discipleship. Work while we still have the opportunity. If this is the beginning of the sorrows, how in the world are we going to describe the middle and the end of the sorrows? 
Jesus is going to describe a time of intense persecution, affliction, killing, hatred by the nations. Jesus is going to describe a time of apostasy, division, betrayal, false leaders offering false hope. But then Jesus is going to describe a time of global evangelism where the gospel is preached in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus doesn't say, Oh, by the way, everyone on the earth is going to be converted. You know what he does say? Everyone. Everyone. Everyone has to hear the gospel. It's not your job to convert anybody. But it is your job to give everyone the gospel. To give them the opportunity to turn from their sin and turn to the Savior. Jesus indicates a future desolation and tribulation that's going to prompt further warnings, which we're going to look at, the Lord willing, in the weeks to come. But now, we're going to have communion. And again, it's interesting to me that when Jesus describes communion or the Lord's Supper. He talks about sacrifice, but he also talks about the future. The Bible says that on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take this and eat it, all of you. This is my body which will be broken for you. The Bible says again, he gave thanks and praise. He took a cup and he passed it around and he said, take this and drink. This is my blood, which will be shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. And then he said these remarkable words. When you do this, you show forth my coming. What? How in the world does eating this bread... And drinking this cup become a picture of his future coming. Because Jesus basically says at the end, he says, I'm not going to do this anymore until I do it with you in a future kingdom. Jesus is going to come back. Remember when we partake in communion, what we are basically doing is we're reminding of ourselves of the love of Jesus, of the sacrifice of Jesus, what it means to have our sins forgiven. But we also are reminding ourselves that the promises that he made about our salvation also apply to the promises that he makes about our future, that he will come again. And by the way, part of that promise is no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, no matter how your life unfolds and wherever life will take you, Jesus will find you. And if for whatever reason you don't survive this week, he'll find you and he'll bring you back to life. And if for whatever reason you do happen to be that generation that lives until the coming of Jesus, he will still find you and he will receive you to himself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, even as we partake of this communion, Lord, we pray that we would remember the promises that you made. You said, take, eat. This is my body which will be broken for you. Again, you said, take, drink. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and the everlasting covenant an unchanging agreement that will apply to each and every person who says to you, I love you. I believe you. I believe that you're the satisfying solution to the problem of my sin. And even in this simple act, I'm reminding myself that everything that you've said about yourself is true. And everything that you said about the future is also true. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake.